very pleased to welcome you all here to this seminar of the Digital Humanities Research Group at the University of Western Sydney. And today we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Glenn Rowe, who is lecturer in Digital Humanities in the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University. Uh, Glenn is an internationally recognised expert in digital humanities research and in particular in areas of French literature and literary history, text mining, machine learning, data-driven research more generally in the humanities and computational text analysis, historical linguistics and in the history of the book amongst other areas. Uh, you can tell he has many diverse research interests. Glenn was appointed as lecturer in digital humanities at the ANU in 2013 to the newly established Centre for Digital Humanities Research there. Prior to that, he held a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship in digital humanities at the University of Oxford, which was the first such digital humanities position at that institution. And today, Glenn is going to be speaking on the topic of distant readings, data mining approaches to the French Enlightenment. Please welcome Glenn. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as my panel suggests, I do want to talk about distant reading and data mining. Sometimes there's sort of uh, human equivalency that I'd like to pick apart. So I'd like to problematize both terms, both distant reading and data mining. So for once, the enlightenment is not the problematic term <laughs> in this issue. Uh, but I've been thinking more and more recently as distant reading has, for whatever reason, become, and this is especially the case in the US, has become uh, co-opted, I guess, with digital humanities in general. So this idea that uh, both distant reading is digital humanities research, here in full stop. Uh, and that literary research in general is at the fore of digital humanities research. I think that's an unfortunate thing. Um, and then what goes along with that is this idea that close reading is the sort of uh, understood, it's not a problem, right? That close reading is this paradigm against which distant reading is working. Um, but I don't think that's a, this is a, this is a truism at all. So this is Foucault you know, working in his office. And, uh, this is the idea maybe we have as a humanities scholar who's there deeply engaged in his research, uh, who will then offer us a reading, right? Who will offer us an interpretation. Uh, and this is how we use normally reading in literary studies, at least now, as this idea uh, not of reading for enjoyment or pleasure and instruction, as well as told us, but it more or less to offer uh, an interpretation based on a deep analysis of the events. Um, so I'd like to say, is this really how we read? Is this how we do research? Uh, even in literary studies, is this how everyone does research? Aren't there other ways of reading, <clears throat> other ways of doing research? And this, for me, comes back to this idea of reading as interpretation uh, as opposed to uh, research as scholarship in this sort of idea of Wissenschaft in French science, right? So this idea that, the, the, so my point is that, in fact, there was a long tradition of not reading, whether we call it distant or not, uh, that is part of humanity scholarship, and that we've been doing for a long time, uh, and, it, and now occurs in, in the digital humanities. So this is just some idea of, of these sort of uh, antinomies that are set up about readings, so where we read closely or distantly, at surface or at depth, presently or absently. This is, a, this is the idea that's come out of fairly recently about surface reading. And so for years, there was, in the humanities and in literary studies, there was this symptomatic reading, right? So you, a scholar would engage with the text in order to uncover what was absent or latent and give us this interpretation. Now people are saying, let's pay attention to what's on the surface, to how texts work, to how texts mean. Um, and I think this is a good move, uh, but it's also still at the level of the text, so we're still at a very small scale level. And what happens when we move up a, a level in scale is that things change, and the object of study becomes good, different. So instead of reading one book, interpreting one book, we're thinking about literature as the national system, as the transnational system, as the world system, as Franklin Brady calls it. And this troubles many people, uh, especially in the US. So this was about a week or so, two weeks ago. You know, you haven't really arrived, I guess, at the truth we deal with until you get attacked in the new republic. So, okay, you know, so technology, and then, again, this is this conflation of the digital humanities with just literary studies, and in particular with English departments. Uh, and to my knowledge, this really only happens in the U.S., but it's fairly prevalent. And so this is, this is a, he's a poet, I think, uh, a person who wrote Adam Kirsch, 
And so he's very concerned about treating literature as this big, <coughs> amorphous thing and losing its particularity. And so I like to make the case that uh, if distant reading is done right or gain my point of digitalism, right, and that you have both the generality and the particularity. So we, we don't lose specificity, but we may gain some knowledge of the general. Uh, and this is, in fact, what uh, Franco Gregg is trying to do. He's trying to undermine this notion of, uh, of, of a closed canon, uh, of literature as a very small thing. And, and he raises this question of scale. Quickly, very early, this was in 2000, before he was more quantitative than computational, I'd say. Um, and he raises this question of you know, 200 novels, if that's your canon of, of the 19th century English novel, which would still be pretty large. It's tiny, it's minuscule compared to what he calls the great red, so less than 1% of all novels. He's a close reading here, it won't help you. It won't help you to learn, uh, even if you could read all these novels, it still won't help you how they, how they work. And so the key bit for him is that a field of selection cannot be understood by stitching together separate bits of knowledge about individual cases, because it isn't a sum of individual cases in collective systems. For him, systems um, is a key point, and this has been taken up a lot uh, recently. And it's, 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 it's part of a longer evolution, I'd say, in digital humanities work. Uh, what I call the Genetic 1.0 or 2.0, maybe. Uh, so moving from the specificity of text and coding uh, and, and towards these large mass collections digitized more or less by other entities uh, than universities, such as Google Books. This, of course, leads to a data delusion because it's not humanities unless we have a crisis. Um, <laughs> and this, again, goes back very far to the properties it leaves. And so my idea is that there now are a prevalence of big data approaches to humanities collections. Are these appropriate for humanities research in general, literary research in particular? Is liter literature data? And maybe we have another sort of famous repulse against the digital humanities by another, uh, in this time, novelist, Stephen Marsh. Uh, so literature for him is not data. <coughs> and he quite tell you about Now, this very first line, big data is coming from your books. <laughs> There's just a sense of paranoia here. Um, but for me, I'd say that literature is, in fact, data, at least in the way that we think about it. And in some of the words that I work with, I don't know if it's big data or not, but in parentheses, it depends on your family. And for social sciences, it's certainly not that big. For astrophysics, it's minuscule, but it's quite big for us to work on these levels. From about 7 million words, <coughs> so some of the collections I work on, 23 million words. The electron connectment up through Martin Mueller's collection in the northwestern of, of just under a billion words and 23,000 volumes. Uh, there are much larger, obviously, we know about these collections and echo of about 200,000 works. Google Books is now up to 22 million works. Uh, and the Hathen Trust is just a small set of that. And this is a question of scale then in literary scholarship, uh, not so much of method. Uh, but it's something that Greg Crane has raised in 2006, which is still relevant, although maybe you go up to what would, what would you do with 20 million books. Um, <clears throat> he makes the point that, again, close reading here won't help. But for him, only machines can read through the, these books that are, that are readily available. So what does that mean when machines are doing this reading? So that, again, this idea of reading, which is now fundamentally changed, is given agency to a computer. Uh, and how do we deal with that? One way, which has been uh, heavily mediated in the U.S., uh, has been this, uh, the birth of this new field called Coteromics. So this is a direct outcome of, of the Google Books project. Uh, and this is Jean-Baptiste Michel, <coughs> who is a, a data scientist, and Erez uh, Aden, who is a biological, um, <coughs> computational biologist. Uh, and they work with this esteemed group, number of which humanities, to come up with this field of cultural models, which is a, quanti a strictly quantitative approach to cultural trends uh, over time. Uh, and I don't really have time to go into my methodological reservations about cultural models. It's only to say that at least, at the very least, they have made their data available. And we maybe all play on Google and Graham View and Larry View at the moment. That's one. The Anton calls it the gateway project to digital humanities, and it may be. <clears throat> but in this case, it, it, it illustrates a good point. So if I take uh, religion and philosophy and I map them against each other in the 18th century in France, um, <clears throat> I'm left here with a job of interpretation. So I have to do a reading of this 
reading of this reading, right? so it's an infinite sort of thing to go back. And maybe on the surface, I'm quite happy that uh, between 1715 and 1760, there is this apparent uh, you know, peak of philosophy. And so this is a work on the Encyclopédie. This is when the Encyclopédie is published. I can say, oh, this is proof positive that Diderot and his work had such a profound effect on French society. But <clears throat> it's probably much more problematic than that. And then what do you do with this great rise in religion right, around, the, around the revolution? In fact, I'd say, although I have no way of proving this one way or another, is that these are sort of uh, resonances of anti-philosophical work here around the Encyclopedia, and of course, the anti-religious uh, ferment uh, around the revolution. But I don't know, because I can't, you can't really get in. There's no point of entry online. And if there were, there'd be so many works they wouldn't know how to interpret it. My act of reading would be <coughs> useless. And uh, Moray gets around this because clearly there's a problematic relationship to text uh, <coughs> behind the graph. Behind the graph are all these texts out of which the graph is, is generated. I'm interested in text as a scholar in, in, in literature. Uh, Franco Moretti gets around this in, in a way that's uh, quite interesting and intriguing, but it's somewhat problematic. So for him, between the very small, so formalistic components of the text and the very large. <clears throat> if the text itself disappears, it's, it's fine. Okay? It's one of those cases where he can say less than one. So if we want to understand, again, the system in its entirety, which is what he's interested in, we must accept losing something for him, uh, this is the text. But I'm not quite ready to follow in that way. And this has been taken up now. I think this reading has become more or less a proxy for data visualization and data mining and other tools. And Matt Joggers, who founded the very lab at Stanford with Frank O'Reilly, uh, has a recent book on macro analysis, which is quite good, but very computational. So, in, in as much as Frank O'Reilly is quantitative in scope, Matt is computational. And I think that's a, an important distinction. Um, and so, for macro analysis, we're given the, the beautiful images that aren't somewhat intractable. So, this, if you don't notice, it, is the 19th century novel. In English. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so this is like a way out, so I figured Moby Dick is in there somewhere. Uh, and this isn't a dedicated work. I mean, Matt could explain this to us, he could interpret it, so this is really about it. And how he got this, it's a long process. Um, but the point being is that we're here at a, at a point of interpretation that's very difficult uh, at this sort of scale and at this level. Um, and there are other ways of doing the sorts of macro analysis or distant reading that are borrowed from different fields. You can think about network analysis, <clears throat> which comes out of the social sciences and that and how people uh, sort of cohere in the social networks. This is the Dutch Republic of Letters and taking metadata from uh, this large epistolary collection, seeing who writes to whom, and then mapping it in certain ways. It's a way of looking at this system in its entirety, as, as Reda would like it and getting something out of that. That's one I particularly like. It's uh, the uh, history of philosophy according to Wikipedia. So this is, uh, this is a, a folk song, as it's called, right? So people have gone into Wikipedia, and there's a rubric that says influenced by. So for every philosopher's entry, there's an influence by, and people have put in, you know, Marx is influenced by, uh, Schopenhauer, or whatever it is. And then you map it based on uh, these different, and it works, it works fairly well. You get, Kant in the philosophy here, the class is Kant in the middle as this great ball of philosophical gravity pulling everyone into a mix we know sort of show power. Uh, Wittgenstein and the, and the empiricists at the bottom. So it's an interesting way of thinking about it. You have Wikipedia, all the articles on philosophers of Wikipedia. You can visualize it like this. Um, and you know, for me, I'm always interested in outliers, so I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is, but uh, I'd love to know where these little points uh, about where I go. And of course, you can map things different. It doesn't have to be in terms of networks, or you can build your own networks based on <coughs> geographical locations, or what's known as a geographic information system. And this is the Stanford Project mapping the Republic of Letters. Uh, and in this case, they take a letter that, that starts somewhere <coughs> and ends somewhere else. Right? So we have a letter from vote there that goes to Kies, um, or Naples, or Venice, and it, it makes a record. Uh, and that in and of itself is fairly uninteresting. Right? But when you put all the letters together, in this case we have 64,000 uh, letters in this database, and you can begin to think about delimiting 
uh, that is just by one particular author to one particular place. Um, then it gets fairly interesting because you are given a sort of snapshot of activity. Uh, this is Voltaire's network. Um, the problem being is that some people may think that this is, um, if you give this to someone who says this is Voltaire's network, they'll say, this is Voltaire's network, as it has been and always was. And in fact, it's just the letters we have, it's just with the data that exists in this database. And, fact, and it's not actually complete. So we're missing all these letters from England. Um, and that's because the data, it doesn't fit this model. There's a lot of letters that go to an indus, indus it's, it, this is based on one particular point in time. So if a letter goes to the Swiss cantons, you can't map it in this system. Because the Swiss cantons is a bigger entity than these little tiny cities. So it's an idea of taking something from the sciences, which is a geographical information system, not thinking that closely about what it means that place and time change, and that if you, if you don't allow for a certain amount of flexibility, uh, you'll end up with skewed results. But I'm not. It's still a good tool. This is so you can compare one network to another. This is Rousseau's network, one on top of each other. Um, and this comes out of a longer tradition, as I, I was able to know. These things really aren't that new. Uh, as I said, not really. The distant reading has a very long history. I trace it at least back to the NL school and this little quantitative term in French historiography. If not back to 19th century philology, right? when people are thinking about the importance of thinking about text not as a narrative but as the pieces that are composed of all these different discrete little pieces of language that can be tracked in different ways. But uh, something like book history that comes directly out of the NL school uh, is a way of thinking about literature as an object of scholarship, but not really as an interpretive uh, object of reading and intense close reading. Right? So it's about counting rather than reading, looking at library holdings, censorship records, etc. And there's even sort of pre-digital visualizations. This is the communications circuit of Robert Brenton uh, in revolutionary France. And here, this is a good example of something that is pre-digital that I'd like to revisit in the digital and see if we can reconstruct something uh, that's this rich, right? And so for me, what's important here is we have media, uh, and then this box is the book, is a book, within this entire matrix of how uh, literature are the literary field is constructed. And that books just occupy this small place. And then we have rumors and songs, poems, letters, pamphlets. This gives you an idea of how much work we have to do with digitization, right? And how many, how much more we have to do, even further than the 25 million books in, in, in Google, because they only occur here. There's really, and there's not to mention this whole sort of social side of trying to reconstruct that. So for me, it's a good example of how sometimes the analog is richer than the digital. Maybe perhaps always. And so basically, not reading, I'd say, is a certain, it is a longer tradition of humanity song where we examine <coughs> things that aren't exactly the text themselves, but are related to the text, concordances and metadata, frequency lists and classifications and collocation tables. And for, for my own work, I like to put this broadly within a certain uh, thinking about long durée approaches to literary takeaway over time, Kirchhoff's works, or conceptual history, because we should go back to Foucault and epistemic change. Uh, but I think more generally, from literature studies to historical studies, we can think about um, using digital methodologies, and I'll get to the digital the data mechanics, as a way of thinking about new areas of genre criticism, thematic criticism, narratology. If you can break down and define new formalisms, we can begin to track how they move through the information space. And this is where data mining comes in, uh, in this way, because there are all these suites of algorithms that are developed in the computer sciences um, that do just that, that look for patterns, that try to trace textual patterns over time. Um, and these are biological commercial applications, so spam filters, things like that. Uh, and again, the question needs to be raised, are these appropriate for humanities research? Um, can we shed light on a black box? Lots of times if you use these sorts of tools and algorithms, we don't know how they function. Uh, we don't have the mathematical wherewithal to think about it. And this should then foster a greater cooperation between computer science and digital humanities. <clears throat> and in fact, I have to think, uh, I don't like the term data mining anymore as a metaphor uh, because 
you know, it gives the idea that you have this resource, which you then drill into, you take out the good parts, and you leave the rest, which is fun, which is wasted. I'd like to think more about the resource um, development, or that we're putting more information back into the data that we have. So we're enriching resources rather than mining them. And you can do this in, in, in various ways. But just a question about starting out with this data mining. So Ian Wooden, who is in New Zealand, I think, right? He's at the University of Ukiah, we wrote the data. At least the book that I have on data mining. And he says quite clearly that it's a pretty easy uh, concept to get your head around. It's about the extraction of implicit previously unknown, potentially useful information, data. The idea is to build computer programs that sift through databases automatically, seeking regularities and patterns. Strong patterns, of course, you can generalize and move up, but many patterns will be banal and uninteresting. Others will be spurious, contingent on accidental coincidences in the particular data set used. And my sense of that, from the banal to the uninteresting to the spurious, contingent and accidental, this is the realm of the humanity. This is what we're really, really interested in. And so we have to think about how we can use data mining, which is interested more or less in strong patterns for prediction, uh, to get out of these other spurious interests. And so for where this is work that goes back five or six years at the University of Chicago, we basically looked at data mining in three different ways. And this is a sort of arbitrary distinction between predictive classification, comparative classification, and similarity measures. You could also group these two into what's known as supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And I'll show you examples of all these. And in this case, with predictive classification, this is the wide, probably the most widely used data mining technique. It's for sort of, if you think about recommendation systems or span filters. The computer reads the text, of course, identifies the words most associated with each class that you get with these labels, and then it, it puts, it processes this into their proper categories. But for us, in the uh, humanities, how this could be beneficial, we can extract classes and labels from contemporary documents, so from, let's say, an 18th century encyclopedia, as we'll see, and we can use this classification system, rather than a modern uh, ontology, to classify other texts or other chunks of text within this, uh, within this historically contingent period. The problem is that information space in the humanities is always a bit noisy and incoherent, right? So if we take the Encyclopedia, which is this great uh, text of the 18th century, which has all these multiple different layers of authorship and authority, uh, it's, a, it's a work of 140 different people, <clears throat> many of which were uh, anonymous, but it's supposed to be structured in a way that reflects the full uh, richness of human knowledge. It's almost a data mining uh, dream. It's an ideal case. And so in this case, most articles of the 74,000 have a class of knowledge. So the both of both in metaphysics. Uh, there were, in fact, 13,000 articles that don't have classification, so 18%. Uh, and so the first sort of experiment we wanted to run was to train a classifier on those classified articles, on the labels that we have, and then generate a model which will be used to both classify the unknown instances, to classify these 13,000 articles, and then a second step to reclassify all 74,000. And, and what happened, and this sort of really scandalizes the French, is that uh, what you get, it turns out that there was about 2,900 classes, separate classes in the encyclopedia, of which the great majority of them had one article that long. It's a terribly inefficient uh, system of classification, but, but particularly human. Um, and so the algorithm goes through and it optimizes this to 360 classes. And it says basically, I don't need 2,899 classes. 360 will do. I can fit all 74,000 articles into those 360 classes. Uh, so this is a question of the loss of specificity. Again, the loss of specificity uh, for the optimization of, in this case, of the algorithm and of the classification model. Uh, and it does very, it does pretty, I, I would say, spectacularly well. So if we look at unclassified articles in the Antiquity, the first one is the preliminary discourse written by Dan Bale. So it comes back as philosophy as it should. And you can just see some good examples of, of this. This would step out. So you have all these the charters that come back as jurisprudence. This one is ecclesiastical history. So again, hopefully, this uh, says, well, this is an outlier. What's going on here? You can then read the text 
and see sort of where that vocabulary shades towards ecclesiastical history rather than jurisprudence. Uh, but hopefully, it, it, it helps you think about the plasticity of each uh, category rather than um, if one is wrong, or one label is wrong, or the other is not, which isn't very helpful. <coughs> if we think of a class like Bell Network, these are all the articles that come back uh, as Bell Network that are unclassified, the, for which I probably agree with all of those. Um, <coughs> and so, this is a way of adding information again, uh, uh, enriching a resource. These are articles that don't have classification, so you can't search for that letter and find Derrick Molière or Pope or Pope, you have to search for the head word. This is a way that you could introduce something into this data set uh, that adds information. You can also do a sort of comparative classification using the same model uh, to compare it to itself, to its original labels. So this would be using classifiers in the form of hypothesis testing. Um, and you can do this for a variety of reasons. So you run the trained model on the same data that you trained it, right? So you then hide the labels that you've given it already, and you tell it to reclassify itself. Uh, in this case, you can find the accuracy of classification. You can draw out the most salient features of what were the most salient words in the decision between putting this uh, article in jurisprudence as opposed to ecclesiastical history, or find these errors or misclassified instances. And here again, these errors or outliers are really the richest resources of inquiry for, for humanists. So in the encyclopedia, again, in this model of 360 classes, to, it came back with about 73.3% uh, classification rate, which is actually about, depends on how you feel about it, but I think it's actually really, really good. Um, if it came back with 100%, if it came back at 50%, it would be a coin flip. If it came back at 100%, it would be a miracle, and then be really completely un uninteresting. There'd be nothing to investigate, it would just sort of, in the solipsism, right? I forgot that Diderot was perfectly right in all of his decisions. Um, so it's this area here that's interesting, right? These you can't, these could give you more information about an unclassified article, but they, they may tell you more about their or they may not, but you have to go through each one and decide is this a good label or not, which is probably a waste of time. Uh, these that are classified correctly don't really tell you much either because they just give you what you already knew. But it's these sort of incorrect classifications that could push us further, could act as heuristic tools into, uh, into thinking about the database. And they fall into different categories of why they're reclassified differently. In this case, this is one of these, uh, of these really tiny classes of knowledge. So uh, net merchants, uh, in fishing net merchants, is a class of knowledge, of which it has one article, a clue, which are these little tiny hooks. Uh, that you put nets together with, right? So clearly that's too small, and the other articles can't do this. This goes up to fishing. Uh, and then the, the, you can see the, the algorithm making these broad classes of knowledge that can fit in more of these things. The Tepidario is a German, oh, uh, German is a Roman uh, bathhouse. Uh, and it, it, it goes into this class literature, which is the strange class in the 18th century, because it doesn't mean what we think. Belletra would mean literature. Literature in the 18th century, what they're talking about is sort of learned knowledge, right? So you cite the literature about something, that's how we use it now. Um, and so anything in antiquity would have to do with literature, period, at least in lots of opinions. But for us, the vocabulary, it's more about architecture because it describes how we deal with territory. And then actually, which I quite like, is another fishing one. And it's actually about worms, the worms that you grow in your garden so then you can go fish. But in fact, the article is about how you cultivate your garden so that these worms will thrive. So, so the projected classroom effect is showing now. Hopefully, uh, but this is a way of thinking about how categories aren't so cut and dry. And again, to look back at the lettre, in the 18th century, you can see uh, how the, or the algorithm is suggesting other different uh, classes that may go with it, may, uh, may give you a broadening idea of what Belletto meant in the 18th century from music and uh, metaphysics, grammar, literature, uh, even up to jurisprudence. So it's an idea of broadening a category uh, through the algorithm. But of course, there are glaring steps, if you will. The famous article on this esprit, which is this great 18th century <coughs> notion, written by Voltaire, of all people. Uh, and it's, of course, in philosophy, and, and the machine comes back with chemistry. 
It's not the poor French, just this thing of really trying to kill the Earth drain with these terrible machines. But it's actually really interesting. So this is this idea of an outlier uh, that can lead. So you, if you go in and you look at the article, this provokes you to sort of, I'm going to read this article. And there is a little section where Voltaire talks about how in chemistry they use this idea of the spirit, right? But, and then we get this term as in the spirits that we drink. Uh, and so it's more about an alchemistic view of chemistry at the beginning of the 18th century, and, and then you can run a you can run a word search of this pre within the article of chemistry, and it gives you an idea that this is a, a class that's in the, it's it, it's in the it's in the process of changing during the 18th century, it's in the process of modernizing, and so half of the Antiquity before the author Macmillan died, the, the chemistry articles were about alchemy, were about the sort of the coalescence of spirit. And then the other half, uh, after my own eyes, of the chemistry hour, are more modern. So this is its great moment you can see within the encyclopedia the tensions that are there perhaps you didn't see before. You can also use this sort of classification on other texts if we take an outside text. It's contemporary of Dira's elements of phys uh, physiology. You can take the same model, classify different chunks, right? And, and perhaps give you a good idea of what they're talking about, uh, at least in the very rudimentary sense, right? And then another thing you can do is step up a level and think about how these 360 classes operate together, again, as a system that Moretti talks about. Then we know they already had a system in the Encyclopedia, uh, but it's one that's published at the beginning of the work, and it's top-down, rather, and it doesn't really reflect what's going on in the Encyclopedia itself. So this is this whole notion of understanding that comes from Francis Bacon, uh, which is that understanding is divided into memory, reason, and imagination, in which you get uh, all of the different arts and sciences, full poetry, sort of by itself. You see where the humanities even existed in, in the 18th century. Uh, it's this blank space. <clears throat> but is that how uh, our, our, uh, <clears throat> our system of knowledge that we generate the algorithm, is that how it um, shakes out? And it turns out it's much more forward looking in its organization. So you can then map how each of these categories, and this is not at the article level, but it's at the class, class of knowledge level, how they group with each other, how they cluster, um, like to do. And you get a pretty interesting uh, clustering of what we would, I would consider the humanities at the top, physical sciences, physics, chemistry, et cetera, in the middle. <clears throat> and the bottom of biological sciences and natural history, which falls out of natural history becomes something that doesn't exist anymore in the 19th century. Nonetheless, this is what I would say is a more uh, forward-looking 19th century organization of the disciplines that are in, at the end of the 18th century are beginning to be put into place rather than the backward-looking medieval uh, Baconian system uh, that's based on the faculties. So perhaps on the ground, uh, this tells us that the encyclopedia is functioning even against its own top-down system of classification. <coughs> Uh, so then we get to this idea of uh, similarity, and this is how we cluster these uh, <coughs> classes of knowledge. Uh, and what, how you do this, and why you do this, you typically build these models, um, and you want to cluster them together. So topic modeling now is sort of all the rage in, in digital humanities, but this is the same sort of idea of taking a text, breaking it into its constituent parts, and then mapping how similar it is to other uh, pieces of text. <coughs> One way to do this is vector space similarity. This is different than, um, than topic modeling. It's the same general idea. Documents are treated as bag of words, which is an unfortunate term, but there it is. So no word order. Uh, you could map the, them into vectors in this sort of interdimensional space. So you can imagine a vocabulary of uh, four words. You have one document that has the word legal in it three times, and all once that becomes a vector which you can map to another vector, the closer they get, you say that they are more uh, similar to each other. So we looked at it for sort of borrowed articles of the Encyclopedia uh, compared to its old, uh, some of its sources, and we got pretty good uh, text. Uh, so this would be the, an idea of what are the most similar articles. So you can imagine, again, the idea of enriching resources. You can imagine you're in the article Noir by Voltaire, you could have a little pop-up box that said, if you like this article, much like Amazon, <laughs> if you like this article, you'll love it. <laughs> uh, but again, what's interesting is these different uh, layers of uh, dialogue that's going on. So you get down, maybe you can see, of course, you have to impart a certain idea of glory to your uh, 
about children's governance. The Christian, is, of course, Christianity is very glorious. But then the city of Po, if you've ever been to Po in France, it's not that glorious of a place. Uh, but it happens to be the birthplace of Henry IV, who was, uh, of course, known for religious tolerance. So for the answer to it is, it was, in fact, the company biography of Henry IV, who was a very glorious figure. Um, this happens again with something like astronomy. So if you go to the most, and these, the larger, the, the larger the sort of <coughs> the classes of knowledge, the more they sort of coalesce. But you get down to all these ones, and you can say, okay, I can sort of see what's going on here. To Wall Street, which is a town in England, uh, and it happens to be the birthplace of Isaac Newton. And so, in fact, the textual strategy of the Encyclopedias was they said, we're not going to give a dictionary of great men and people and kings. There are other dictionaries that do this, or a philosophical dictionary. But nonetheless, they wanted to include these sorts of things to the people that they liked. They include them in, ge in modern geography. So in Wallstrop, it is a town in England. And it happens to be where Isaac Newton was born. And then you get six pages about Isaac Newton. <laughs> and not about law at all. So it's a way of, of, of thinking about the encyclopedia as a, as a more um, textual thing. So I'd say that these, uh, these sorts of uh, approaches are, are, are pretty interesting on in some way. They're well understood, they're standard, uh, you can assign scores, this is the same for, for topic modeling. My reservations, however, is that there's no notion of text order. As a literary scholar, I find that strange. I have a hard time getting my head around, around that. Uh, you have to sort of pre-identify chunks of, of documents for them to work really well. You can't have a big a novel, for example, if you ran into these different things. would have to be broken up into some sort of part, arbitrary or not. Um, and so we really thought about well, how can we use similar techniques to, to, to detect borrowing or reuse or intertextuality, if you will. Um, and so we came upon sequence alignment, which is a sort of algorithm, or suite of algorithms that's used in bioinformatics uh, to sort of see uh, the way of arranging sequences of DNA, you can imagine. Um, finding regions of similarity within a large heterogeneous data source. So for us, and this isn't that big of a step, right, from bioinformatics to literary studies. In fact, there's literature out there about uh, what's called the linguistics of DNA. The DNA has phonetics and lexical uh, structures, it has a grammar. Uh, so perhaps this is an area of, of you need a further investigation. But for us, what we did was to take, uh, take text, break them up into engrams, here you have the first two lines of Rousseau's social contract, we break these up into trigrams, uh, which overlap. So on the people about to the people about to fit, the computer, the program goes in and finds one hit here within two different texts, and then it measures right, in both directions with a certain amount of flexibility. So we can skip words, do different things. Um, and we do get rid of certain function words for matching, but the, but the text remains in it. It's not that we're running analytics on these words or any quantitative technique. It's to identify these shared passages. And again, with the encyclopedia, this is an important thing because we know that they were sort of cycling in or recycling texts that were dangerous that they couldn't necessarily cite um, without retribution. So for example, in the article on Spinoza, who was a very dangerous person to talk about, in the 18th century, they used Bale uh, in his article on Spinoza, which is this wonderful sort of way uh, <coughs> that they use a way of criticizing ba uh, Spinoza, Spinoza's monism, in, in such a way that the arguments against Spinoza began to look ridiculous, right? And, and, the, and the, uh, the Christian worldview would begin to be undermined just in outlining these things. There's no surprise they did this. But the surprise is the extent to which they use bail. And in fact, they even, they even conclude their article in Bale's voice, right, without quotation marks, right? And they say, je finis par lire, so I'm, I finish concluding this way, uh, which is just you know, taken exactly from Bale without any indication of that. And so we've, we've pushed further on this. We can look at the way Montesquieu is used. Perhaps the most interesting is we can use uh, uncorrected text. So this is from the Aleko. Uh, this is uh, Locke's second treatise. And so to use Locke was a very dangerous thing. Well, you could use his treatise on how to educate children and be all right. Uh, 
But if you use the second treatise, you can control it. It's a band work. So you lose the privilege of answering. But nonetheless, they want to use them. And they use them all through <coughs> this article on government, but without any sense that it will ever mention the law. And so this has recently led us to think about how the encyclopedia takes works and cites works in ways that are very different. Um, and so one work is not equal to another. So you can always cite the Oliette, it's uncontroversial, but you can't cite the Lettre Philosophique, which was a band during work. And so you get around this in different ways. In this case, there is quotation marks, although it's not one set quotation. There is a, a mention of Voltaire, and this innocuous title, Mélange de Littérature de Philosophie, which is one of these compendium patterned works that had all of these different pieces of Voltaire in it. Uh, but in fact, the sequences we get come exactly from uh, Lettre Philosophique. So it's a way of citing and non-citing, and it's a way of recycling uh, <clears throat> dangerous words into an approved uh, encyclopedic entry. And depending on how dangerous a work was, they would use different strategies. So De L'Esprit is the materialist track that was in, sort of in directly ruled, indirectly responsible for the encyclopedia losing its privilege because he was an encyclopedia's author, the church condemned it, it was put on the index, and the encyclopedia loses its privilege. So to cite him, you really, really have to want to be able to cite him. Um, and Jokwa does, and the way he does it is he doesn't offer us any formal um, indication that this is a citation, but he says this quick little thing, c'est de ce siècle. So it is as a, as a great genius of this century has told us. So as you know, it's basically that's as formal as we can get. Uh, and then we have this, uh, this citation. So the code of of the time would know this. The 18th century reader would know this. It's lost to us. So this is this idea that we can begin to think about identifying these passages, whether we want to say what this is or not, at least the identification of this enriches this resource uh, and makes us have a better understanding of how it works. And this is just, Dan Elsa and I worked on this in a sort of semi-systematic manner, but just to show that uh, for all of these works, the publication status, whether they were approved or not, uh, had a great bearing on how they were cited in the institute using this technology. And then finally, a few other directions using, again, the sequence line of technology that uh, I'm working on now. One is the idea of literary uh, field, literary culture. <clears throat> so we take electronic enlightenment, which is 60,000 letters from the late 16th, 17th century to the early 19th century, and we compare it to itself. So we have all these letters, all these authors, and what comes out are commonplaces, <clears throat> which are interesting for the way they circulate, not for not for these, exactly. there's no genetic relationship between this passage, this passage, this passage. But what makes it interesting is that all three are using them in the context in which they're using uh, this little snippet from Juvenal. Um, we do this, we can do this in the Latin, and we can think about the tracking means, right? That sort of memetics of the commonplace, how they're born and die, and track through this information space. A good one is uh, Rabelais <coughs> makes up his own commonplace. <laughs> which is that the greatest clerks are not always the best, the, the wisest men. That's basically what I said. And then Montaigne, who is in fact a walking con in this book, cites Rabelais. And then in the 18th century, what's interesting again is how it circulates and how it's used. And in fact, Voltaire, so Pri uses this all the time. And what they're doing is that when someone like Evans Hughes gets placed on the index or gets his privilege revoked, or, you know, Voltaire says it's okay, you know, the greatest court clerks are never the wisest men. And it's just a way of speaking a common language uh, within a common culture. And so our idea then, and this is the project that we're going on now, <coughs> is to track these sort of commonplaces. So to take something like Echo, um, to compare it to itself, to bring out all the commonplaces, and not to say that here's a quantitative analysis of how the commonplace exists in the 18th century, but to say that qualitatively, what makes a commonplace important is that it occurs twice, right? It occurs more than one place. And why is that important, and how can we do that? And this will take visualization, it will take sequencing, it will take data mining, all of this, as a sense of pulling out information, but then enriching it back into uh, our data set. And so I guess I'm 
for uh, one, yeah, one other area, along with this, would be a sort of historical media study, which I'm also interested in, where texts become media events in and of themselves. And so we have to understand a bit about the 18th century and how texts circulated. Uh, they didn't circulate in books, as we saw in, in Robert Darnton's. <coughs> uh, they did sometimes, but most of the time they circulated uh, by word of mouth, by manuscript tradition, little snippets. Uh, and this is interesting. So we know that there's a event. There's, there is um, the Great Earthquake in Lisbon, which happens in uh, November of 1755. It shakes Voltaire's sort of faith in divine providence, if you will. He writes a poem, which comes down to us something like this. Modern editions look even more different. Uh, he writes a poem about this. <coughs> And in fact, if we go to the letters of the electronic Latin, we see a first resonance of this text in 2nd of January, so it's very soon after the published. And it's not the whole thing. And in fact, he says, I've been able to get my hand on just the end of this poem, because that's how he's inserted. It wasn't the whole poem, it was just the end. And in fact, of this end, of these eight final verses, we only get four that show up in our matching. And that's because this is the first version um, of the poem which Voltaire was unhappy with because it was a little too pessimistic. So it ends with que faut-il au Montel, au Montel, faut souffrir, se soumettre en silence, adorer, mourir. So what can we do? Mortals must suffer, submit in silence, love God and die. Right? So it's not the greatest, <laughs> happiest ending from the poem. And he knows this, so he's trying to work through it. So he sends out other versions that don't, that don't come down with some of modern editions uh, to his friend, trying to rework this. And you can see it sort of growing, right? You can see the, the sequence getting closer to the modern edition that we have, <clears throat> until finally another person writes to Switzerland, to Van Haller, and says, you know, the other day, the other afternoon, I was in the presence of Voltaire the Great, and he had the compliments and reviews, and he had the great biographer clip of him reading his great and wonderful piece on the, on the matters of Lisbon. And here I have just the last conclusion of this retouched piece. So it gives you an idea that, that these texts, these pieces of text, the books that come down to us have a history, have a particular history, and it would be a shame if we didn't take that into account. And how can we use big databases, these sorts of techniques, to enrich, again, our idea of books as social objects with text and with history behind them? And finally, another thing on, on books and text as the media events. Uh, then we know that someone finally writes to Rousseau in 1756 and says, you know, there's this poem circulating out there, it's very pessimistic, it questions divine providence, how can you let this pass? And of course Rousseau, not one to uh, sit on a challenge, decide he will respond, and he responds in this 7,000 word letter to Forte, which comes down to this. We know, we refer to it now on optimism, <clears throat> and so he sort of Somewhat but clumsily defends divine providence and the Leibnizian worldview. Voltaire's not impressed, and we know how Voltaire then responds with continuity of Genisma. But again, and this is especially important for students, if we could get them to think about just this image, which comes from Google Books, uh, think about it. It's the title we know, translated from German, it wasn't, by Dr. Ralph. No, that's not true. The only thing true, and it was supposed to it's supposedly from Amsterdam, no, it's published in London. The only thing that's true, sort of, is the date, right? So it's this idea that texts are important and have a history, and that if we're going to build new resources that take into account this, um, technology is going to be important. And so if we can move through this thing, just the visualization, if we can use intertextuality, in this case, as an approach to maybe scalable reading, and this again comes from Martin Mueller, uh, neither close nor distant, but moving between the two uh, over these large data sets, either curated or uncreated, in kind of tandem with these different reading approaches, we can enrich uh, our data resources that we work so hard to, to look at. We can I, I automatically identify relationships uh, that can, again, enrich scholarly and pedagogical interaction with digital resources, such as the Condit app I app. Or we can reconstruct the early modern commonplace book, which is lost to us, right? We can enable a new sort of historical social media studies. In French, it's called mediology, right? From Leger's Google, which is the scientific study of cultural transmission uh, that valorizes both the virtuality of a digital archive that we all use and the materiality of individual texts as social objects. 
part of Robert Dungeon's communication service that we can maybe reconstruct digitally through a mediation of both the material and the digital communities. I'll stop there.